Hi, I think we're live. I think we're live, Sue. <laughs> it's not coming up on Facebook yet. Oh, okay. Is it on Facebook? Have you found the... Uh, I've got the Ace in August up. Have you got the um, the StreamYard? Uh, yes, we're here. Are we're we all, on there? We're all fit to go, so... We're fit to uh, go. Excellent. Good. So welcome, everybody. Uh, and we're, we're sort of well into Ace in August now, so you've all found something useful. But if you've not yeah. so far, I'm sure tonight you're going to find something really from <laughs> Janet. I can't so, believe that people, if they've been here for more than the today, that they won't have found something useful already. It's been an incredible month. We were just saying earlier, weren't we? It's, it's how amazing yeah. it's been. Um, so hats off to you guys for your organization because uh, bringing you. this together is no mean feat and and you've done brilliantly with it well people have been so generous coming forward and offering to do presentations and talk about oh, ace you know really it. easy to organize so uh, we, we, did all have ace. we all want to talk about it yes <laughs> <laughs> so we're just letting people in people join us we've got 14 live at the moment we shall see if people are looking well if you're looking for it you won't see this so there's no point in me saying come and find it over here <laughs> hopefully people will find it um and maybe sue if you keep an eye on if people are looking for it to yes i'll uh, we'll keep an eye on the comments okay guys all right so what i'm going to do sue is here going to be here in the background keeping an eye on comments and so on so i'm going to send her into the studio um so i'll see you later sue <laughs> Later. <laughs> anytime you want um and what i'm going to do is add instead my presentation there we go so my presentation i'm running on a different machine which is in front of me so if i look down at all it's just so that i know what what keys i'm hitting to move things forward and backwards because otherwise we could end up with all sorts of strange things happening um so hi everybody uh i'm janet janet finley again and um i say again because i came in at the beginning of the month to talk about geeking ace um today i'm going to be talking about acing reactivity and reactivity is uh, it's what i've been working with primarily um for the last decade or so um and so it's something that's really close to my heart of what we we get to do I've just seen yeah we've got lots of people able to hear us yes that's good you also discover that i discovered recently i have add and um which means that i get very easily distracted by the comments that are over there um so if i suddenly stop in mid mid sentence and start looking at those that's that's what's going on there so don't worry about it i'll come back um so yeah so i'm going to be talking about how we can use ace uh for cases where dogs are reactive to things in the environment i'm going to talk a little bit about reactivity and the whole naming of that and the labeling of it and things as well just so that we're all clear on that um but uh but yeah i just wanted to uh, to talk about what we can do what what i've been using what i've used over the last few years from ace how it all fits together uh to use uh ace with reactivity and I'm just trying to find the thing. Okay, so I probably don't need to do this by now. We're on the 27th of the month. So hopefully, unless you've only just arrived today, and I know I did let a few people in earlier because I'd um, posted about this in another group. Um, but hopefully you'll know what ACE is. And if you don't, it stands for Animal Centered Education. It's an integrated approach to animal well-being and education developed by Sarah, Sarah Fisher. And there's various components and the components that we're going to be really focusing on today are the free work and detailed observations. Um, but we also will use some of the other things, uh, conversational training. In fact, no, can we actually talk about most of this? Most of this um, conversational training games, leading techniques, uh, gentle body work. So there's a whole set of things that come together in an integrated way to support animals um, and their well-being. So free work for those of you, because I know when I talked about this earlier, people didn't know, just so that you know. OK, so you get in free work, you've got a number of different surfaces, a number of stations, different height things. You can have things like uh, snuffle mats you saw there. You just put food on those. This could be food that's soft and can be spread about. It could be food that's dropped 
on the ground. It could be chewy food. So you see the dogs are just allowed to explore it and investigate. And the whole point of this is that we are not directing it. The dogs are choosing where they go and what they do. As you can see, you can do it in small spaces. There's probably a little bit too much in this small space for Martha, but um, you know, you can do small spaces in big spaces. And they get to explore, they get to use their nose, they get to lick, as Otter is doing here, they get to chew. And all of those things are really important. And you don't need special equipment, you can just put paper in a box and make things uh, to put in your free work. So, and water, you'll notice there's water in there, also important. So what we're doing is with free work is we're setting up an environment for the dogs to explore. And um, we want to then be able to observe them. So as they are gathering information about their environment and what's going on there, we can gather information about them. So free work is, um, oh, can't find that bone feeder in the USA. You can't find it in the UK either. Um, that bone feeder is uh, the rarest thing on the planet. And if anybody has got one, they are worth their weight in gold. They are brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'm afraid I can't help. There is a, a, a cat version, which is little fish that stick out, which I think you can still get on Amazon, but uh, no, the bone one, it's, mm, I don't know. If, if, I don't know if they even make it anymore. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't want to play that again. No, I press the right key. Okay. So before we talk about how we're going to use ACE and free work in uh, with reactive dogs or dogs who can be reactive, I prefer to say that. Um, I just want to say a word about reactivity, the word reactivity, because um, there's there's quite a move away from describing dogs as reactive. And, and, I, and I absolutely get that um, because our dogs, we are all reactive. Reactivity, being reactive is a very natural thing. You know, if somebody comes up behind me and surprises me, I will react. Um, you know, if something happens in my environment, then I will respond, I will react to it. It's, it's, a, it's a normal thing and it's something that we all will do and all of our dogs will react to something sometime. So what we're really talking about when we're talking about a reactive dog, and I put that in quotes, is a dog who is overreacting from a human perspective. So from the dog perspective, the dog doesn't feel that they're overreacting. And actually, they're not. They're just responding as their emotional response tells them to. So it's, it's, we, it's our interpretation of it, which says that's an overreaction, because we look at the situation, and we see a dog 30 feet away that's minding its own business and that they're on a lead with their person. And our dog barks at that dog. We think that's inappropriate. So we think that's an overreaction and we call that dog reactive. But actually, what's actually happening from the point of view of our dog is our dog sees that dog over there and is frustrated about it because maybe they want to get to them or maybe they are afraid because they've had experiences that worry them about other dogs or maybe they're just not sure and they are responding in some way but they that for them it's a perfectly appropriate response so we might say that they are sensitive to things in their environment that they respond in a way that people feel is inappropriate uh, that is an overreaction that people feel is an overreaction rather than uh, that it is actually it's 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 just a response it's just what the how that dog deals with things and what we want to do is help the dog give the dog support to be able to respond differently so if we find that their response to something their reaction to something is uh, not what we'd like and maybe it's because it, they get really worked up or maybe it's because they kind of start uh, pulling away and wanting to escape. We want to make the, the dog more comfortable. We want to make our dog more comfortable. And so when we're talking about uh, reactivity, we're really focusing on, well, how are we making this environment eat more uh, easier for, for the dog? Okay. I will use the term reactive simply because 
it's a term that we know what we're talking about. And by reactive, I mean a dog that will bark at things in the environment that most dogs might not bark at. OK, so it's kind of like just saying they are responding in a way that we uh, we that, that, that the person with them may be concerned about. Put it like that. Um, and, you know, that we're not this is not a judgment. So I think that's the important thing that we take away from the word is we're not labeling the dog. That's the first thing. So I'm not. Um, I, I try to avoid calling a dog reactive. I, I, I try to avoid describing a dog as reactive. I would rather say a dog who can react to things as opposed to um, a reactive dog, simply because the reactivity is not a characteristic of the dog. Reactivity is um, a behavior that the dog does. It, the dog reacts in certain situations. But the majority of the time for any dog that we're talking about, and if you live with a dog who can react to things, you will know this, the vast majority of the time, that dog is not reacting to things in the environment. The vast majority of the time, the dog is playing or sniffing or doing the things that they do or hanging out with their person. It is only when the environment is tricky for them that they are reacting. And for many dogs who we call, and whoops, I've gone back to that work thing okay for many dogs that we call reactive um that might be happening for a couple of minutes a day so the first thing is it's not a label it's not a um it's it's a description of behavior not a characteristic of the dog and the second thing is to recognize that reactivity is normal and that what we're talking about is something which is judged as being extreme um by the people but obviously it's an emotional response from the dog okay so yeah absolutely get it that um the problem is what other people think of your dog the law in certain countries makes it very difficult if you've got a dog who's barking at other dogs and of course that context is important and i'm not saying that we're therefore uh, not taking reactivity seriously and i often talk about reactivity as a thing as opposed to a specific description of a specific dog um we're not saying that that's not it's not something we want to do something about it's just that we want to be clear what it is we're talking about and not be judging and and uh, labeling dogs that's all okay let's see if i can do this without going back to the video okay so within ace what the, there are five things that i would or five ways or stages if you like but it's it's often um the the different elements that i would use um i may use all i may use some of these when i'm working with a dog who may be reactive in some situations and the five things that would, the ace is really helpful with for me in for reactivity are observation so the first thing is we can use ace we can use free work to gather data about the dog without any interruption and i'll talk a little bit today about some of the things that we want to be noticing that will help us um, because as we know a lot of behavior um, happens because of physical issues things that we may not think of immediately as being related to the behavior so they're not happening they're not specific to the environment that the behavior is happening in but they are still influencing the behavior and we're going to talk about that so ACE uh, gives us a really great context for thinking about that, for observing what's going on with an individual dog. And it gives us a model, um, a model that we use, uh, the, the model of candles, which we're going to talk a little bit about. Second thing is invitation. So invitation is a, an invitation to engage with us. And it's basically, I use this um, as the precursor to doing any work with triggers and i'm going to talk about triggers in a moment but before we start working with our dog with triggers we want to have a way of inviting engagement with us because there will be times even when we're wanting to allow our dogs to have plenty of um of autonomy and agency in the way that they make choices about how they engage with things we will always want to be able to interrupt some behaviors so we want to have some way of inviting that engagement and also using that the invitation that we're giving the dog and their response to it 
to gauge how comfortable our dog is in a particular situation. So that's the second thing is invitation. So the thing is introductions. So introductions is introducing elements of things that our dog may be worried about within free work. So rather than introducing a dog, so let's say we're talking about a dog who's reactive, who can be reactive to other dogs, um, rather than saying, okay, we're going to put them in a room with or in a space with another dog, or we're going to put another dog over there and have them look at them or whatever, we're going to bring an element of a dog. So we're going to bring an element of a dog. So that might be the shape of a dog. It might be the smell of a dog. It might be the sound of a dog. It, whatever is appropriate in that situation. But we're going to introduce the things that they're concerned about at a level that they're not concerned. So what we're always trying to do when we're working with reactivity, working with reactive dogs should be boring. It should look boring. To anybody outside, it should look like watching paint dry. Yeah, you shouldn't see dogs reacting. You shouldn't really be seeing dogs showing any particular interest. You should be seeing dogs just doing what dogs do. And if you're working with reactive dogs or dogs who can react and you're seeing responses, big responses, you're seeing the dog getting really worked up about something, you need to do some introductions first. You need to do the, the intermediate bit where you're introducing elements. So that might be introduce distance. That might be introducing something at a much greater distance. But it might just be introducing a part of that thing. We're going to talk about how you do that. Fourth thing is support. So working with triggers in the context of free work. So I would use free work as a support for dogs who are then working with their triggers. I'd also use it as a support for helper dogs who you're working with. So we'll talk about how we do that. And then the final one is as a scaffold for moving out onto walk. So you can take what you learn from free, free work in a setup environment and you can take that out with you when you go out on walks and use that to scaffold the dog, to support the dog, um, to help the dog to decompress and so on when you're out on walks. So those are the five things we're going to look at. I'm noting we've got 20, uh, we've got about 40 minutes. I might run over a little bit. I did say to Sue earlier that it would be an hour, but I'm hoping it'll be an hour, but we'll see. I might go on a little bit longer. Um, but let's see where we get to with it. Okay. So first one, observation. So this is the step one, if you like, or the first thing that I would be doing. And with any dog, and certainly with dogs who can react to things, I would be looking um, at what we can see is going on for them by just watching what is what they're doing and watching how they're responding to things. And um, there are a number of things that we look for in observation. And you've already got talks about observation. I know Penny did a great talk on observation earlier in the month. So if you want to know the details of this, go and watch that because we're, I haven't got time to go into the details of this. But um, she did a great talk about that. Sarah's done some brilliant, I mean, Sarah's work on this is second, I mean, this is, she, she's she's the, the one who Sarah Fisher has done this work and, and is way ahead of um, anyone, I think, in, in terms of being able to see these things in dogs. So take any opportunity you get to watch Sarah do the talk about uh, observations. But essentially what we're looking for is three key groups of things. We're looking for their nervous system responses. So we're looking for things where the nervous system is responding. It may be that they are um, having a sympathetic nervous system response because they're worried about something. And you may see calming signals in dogs. You may see um, things like the breathing rate will go up. You may see them blinking. You may see their physical posture changing and things like that. So we'll be looking for those things. And we might see those things as they're interacting with free work. So at this stage, we've got no other dogs. We've got nothing like that in the environment. We are basically just working with um, the, single, the single dog within a free work environment and we're watching them. And um, you will basically bring the dog into the space, take all their equipment off. So you are just seeing how they are in the space with, with the free work laid out and you'll watch them. And we'll just be gathering data, if you like. We'll be in watching what, what, what happens, what they do, what they investigate, 
what their gait is like, uh, what their posture is like, when they're comfortable, anything that they're less comfortable about, all of these things. We'll be looking for the nervous system response. We're looking for the postural and physical signs. So that might be the way they position themselves, how they hold themselves. Are they even? Are they? Do they have areas, bits that are tight in the body? Um, is the coat uh, uneven of the different coat patterns that you can see? And then we'll also look at behavioral responses. So how are they behaving towards the different things that they find in the environment? Are there some things that they are avoiding? Are there some things that they are moving towards? Um, how do they respond if there's a noise in the environment? There's a lot of behavior responses we can also see in that. And we're basically building a picture and we might see from that, we might discover all sorts of things which are gonna be relevant to their um, reactive behavior. So it could be that we discover signs that they may be in pain. And before we do anything else, we get to deal with that. We get to, to see a vet and, and get pain relief and all those sorts of things. Um, but again, if you want to know more about observations, have a look at Penny's uh, Penny's talk. I think that there may be been others on and thing, but Penny certainly did a great one. Um, okay. And I wanted to say this is quite important from the point of view of trigger stacking. So those of you who are familiar with reactivity are probably familiar with the concept of trigger stacking, which is basically the, the idea that, um, you know, your dog sees a dog and maybe they're OK, but then they see another dog and that adds to the pressure and then they see another dog and it's the third dog that sends them into a reaction. And it's because you've got these accumulative, so they all add on to each other. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a perfectly good uh, way of thinking about things and it's the way a lot of people think about this. But, but within ACE, we have a different concept that we use um, with, called candles. And it came from Edie Jane Eaton, who's a T-Touch instructor um, in, originally, but it's been developed since by Sarah and others. So um, the idea of, trick, of candles is really helpful because what it does is it allows us to see where we can extinguish some of those contributing factors. So if you think of each candle as being something which might be contributing, might be adding to the, um, the whole picture for the dog, and those things might be stressors in some way. So they might be physical stressors. They may be things that are a little bit irritating. They might be pain. They might be the actual things in the environment that they're seeing that they are worried about. There's all sorts of things that could be candles. And the good thing about the candles analogy is that we can look at it in terms of, well, imagine this because candles give you light, but they also give heat. So if you imagine this as like those little things that light bowls, you know, and if you have a big flame, you might get a reaction straight away. So think about the boiling water as your reaction. The flame is the thing um, and that you may be of multiple ones, but the, there will be some situations where your dog will see something and it's a big enough candle that it will immediately boil over and the dog will react. And in that situation, one thing that you can do is just reduce the intensity of that. So that might be moving further away. It might be um, taking your dog out of a situation. It might be if the big candle is pain, it might be pain relief. Um, and then when you reduce that big candle, then the the you take the water off the boil. So that's one scenario, but it's not usually as simple as that. And quite often what you've got is you can have the big candle, but you add a couple of, and if it's on its own, it's all right. But when you add a couple of other things, um, then it's, um, you know, it's adding, it, that's going to, it's those extra things that are going to make the water boil or make the dog react. So you could then blow out. So if you're talking about the water's boiling in that situation where you've got the three, the one big and the two little, it could be that it's blowing out the smaller things that matters. So you might not be able to get rid of the big trigger, but if you can deal with these other things, you can still bring the, the level of concern down to a point where you don't have the reaction. Um, and the reality is that you usually have lots of factors 
that are all contributing and when they're all lit they're all contributing and what we can do is look at how many of those can we blow out so what can we do to change things and some of those things can be as simple as changing the discs on a dog's collar so if you've got a dog who's noise sensitive and they're wearing jangly discs on their collar, if you just think about that for a minute, they're running around and they've constantly got this thing by their ear going ding, 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 ding. That's very irritating, particularly for a noise sensitive dog. If you change that for a slide attack, you're immediately removing a candle. And it may be a tiny candle, but it's a candle nonetheless. And so that makes a difference. And when you start blowing a few of these out, the water level, the, 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 the heat level comes down. Um, and what you're, I mean, this is the reality is that you have different, different sizes of candles and some of them you can't remove. So you will never be able to eliminate all the candles because we can't do that. We can't remove all the stress from our life. Uh, we can't remove all the stress from our dog li dog's lives, but we can focus on all the different candles that we can identify and we can remove as many, we can blow out as many as we can so that we make it as easy as possible for our dogs. So we're setting them up in the first place for success. And this is why it's really important for us to, um, to do the observation first because the, the observation is where we start to identify those candles. Because that will make sense to people. I just wanted to put this up and just throw you a few things that might be candles for your dog. So pain is an obvious one. Pain is a biggie. Um, and there is research that says that up to 80% of all behavior cases have a pain element. Um, so, you know, it could even be higher, but, but uh, up, up to that. So, you know, pain is massive and um, we can we can see pain. Pain often is um, visible through the way that a dog holds themselves, even when there's nothing clinically um, identifiable on x-rays and things like that. So don't assume that a dog is not in pain just because nothing has been discovered. And it could be that it's hidden pain, like it could be head pain, it could be gut pain, all of those things, those sorts of things make a big difference. Um, harness. If your dog is not comfortable with things on their body, a harness can be a candle. My collie, um, I have a, a smooth collie, who, for whom a, a can, wearing harness is a candle, it lights candles for her. She will wear a harness, she doesn't resist wearing a harness, but she it's its absolutely a candle for her. She changes her whole uh, posture and, and demeanor changes with it. And so quite often she will be walked without one um, um, if it's possible to do it safely. Um, grooming can be, Sue's here in the background, grooming can absolutely be a candle for a lot of dogs. You know, handling of dogs in any way been um, handled in particular ways. I mean, feet touch, those sorts of things. If a dog has had that happen um, some point during the day, then they may be more likely to react later on. Um, loud noises can be. The dog, we've all heard of the cases where the dog is fine and then the neighbors are getting the conservatory built and all the banging and clattering, the dog becomes more reactive. Loud noises can be a candle. Allergy can be a candle. Um, and it may be hidden allergy. So it may be sensitivity to, um, to a particular food. So watch the food that you're feeding and how your dog behaves when they've eaten specific foods. Be monitoring that because, again, it doesn't necessarily mean. So a dog could be sensitive to food without having necessarily an upset stomach. They may It may be food that makes them feel a little bit. Um, you know, this makes them feel a bit icky, um, but there, but it doesn't affect the digestion in the normal sense that we would be looking for. That we, we wouldn't see vomiting or diarrhea or anything like that, but we may just see them slightly looser than normal, or they, or just being a bit grouchy. They don't feel well. Um, visitors, whether they love them or whether they hate them, you know, they may love visitors, but it's still excitement that's outside the norm. And so new people, meeting new people can be a candle. So candles are not necessarily bad things. Candles might be anything that ups your dog's excitement level 
uh, because excitement is a stress. It's a good stress. Stress is not always bad. It's a good stress, but it's still changing um, what's going on for your dog. So we need to take account of those. Being touched on the head, raised voices, dogs playing. There's all sorts. I mean, this is just a small list. There could be loads and loads and loads of different things. So think about that. Um, the and and what um, yeah, think about what what is going on with your dog. So. OK, so free food allergies. Can this cause shallow breathing when no other obvious GI problems are present? To be honest, I don't know. Um, quite possibly. I don't know. Sue, do you know? <laughs> you can jump in. Yeah, no idea. No, I, um, don't, I mean, no, I don't know. But it's worth asking the vet about things because I think uh, this is something Sarah would know. So maybe if we um, we could tag Sarah in that question because she, I'm sure she would have a, a view on that. Um, but certainly there may be no other GI problems. And, and we know this from ourselves, don't we? We know from ourselves that um, when, um, that sometimes we can eat something and we're not ill. We don't have food poisoning. We're not, running to the loo all the time but are we feeling ugh? you know we might have some pain in our stomach or we might feel just a bit heavy or a bit bloated yeah our dogs are the same they have the same sort of digestion as we do it's a very similar sort of stomach system they're not like ruminants with poor stomachs you know they and and so there's no reason to to assume that dogs don't sometimes have those feelings just like headaches we don't think of dogs as having headaches but why the heck why 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 wouldn't dogs have headaches um and so i think there's a whole lot of things that we don't know about pain in dogs and i think we're just starting to discover stuff about pain in dogs um and a lot of people really um and in a lot of vets will take a very um traditional view you know the dog is not limping therefore they're not in pain it's that kind of view and if the dog's still playing there's they're not in pain but you know if a dog's behavior changes when they eat something then there's something going on there's something going on and if you keep a track of what is what the dog is eating so if your dog changes that look, look at when you feed them what you feed them and what their what their response is so if you're seeing reactive behaviors or your dog behavior changing one of the things you want to be monitoring is what they're eating and when and whether there's a pattern because what we're looking for in all of this is patterns um we're looking for patterns to see if you know across the whole of the dog's life are what things are related to what you know, and your vet, to be fair to vets, they don't, they see you for 20 minutes, if that, 10 minutes often. They're not going to be able to see all of those things unless you are monitoring it. So it's up to us to monitor this for our own dogs. Okay. So that's the first thing is observations. And ACE is amazing for observations. Sue. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pop in because this is where it comes back to observations. Um, I just wanted to give an example. Last weekend on Sunday, I was out all day. Of mm -hmm. course, when I got home, my three dogs were really excited to see me. Yeah. I'd only been in about 10 minutes and my mum and dad turned up. And the dogs go crazy when they get here yeah. as well. But I could start to see when my other dogs came near me and my working cock was sitting next to me, I could really see his body start to stiffen. Yeah. Yeah. So we were having to be really careful not to let them get too close because we didn't want him to suddenly lunge out at one of my yeah. existing dogs. But he's, he's usually absolutely fine with my other yeah. dogs. But because he'd had two triggers really close together, two exciting yeah. triggers really close together, it was really... yeah. Yeah. And so that's just the candles adding more and more yeah. heat and, and it goes off the boil. Yeah, that's a great example. It's a great example. And it just, it also helps us to see that it's going back to what we we're saying about reactivity. It's not about dogs being reactive 
or not being reactive. Mm -hmm. They're reactive in some situations when you've got a certain combination of factors and some dogs will be more likely to respond in a particular way than others. But what we're wanting to do is actually find out, well, what can we, how can we set them up to be successful? So when we know that our dog has had these two things going on, which is extra to normal, then just as you said, then you were just more careful about the situation, setting yeah. it up so that it didn't have that that interaction that was more difficult. So yeah. that's a great example. Yeah, and it's just paying attention to those tiny little changes in the body language and again, coming back to observations. Yeah. Totally, totally. And seeing that, being able to see that. So the observations, really important and um, candles, really important. Okay, let's move on to the second bit of this. Uh, have there been any other questions? I've seen there's a few comments that people are saying about. Um... Yeah, there have been more comments than questions at the moment. There's one question here. Dog reacts to yeah. cats. You introduce the smell, sound, or physical cat. We will be talking about this, so I'll come on to this in a minute. Okay. All right. So next. So the second thing is the invitation stage, and the invitation stage is, or the invitation element is that what we'll, before we do anything challenging, and and again, challenging is in quotes because we don't really want to challenge our dogs. We're not making it hard for them, but it's going to be taking them a little bit outside of the comfort zone so pretty much anything if we never step outside of a comfort zone uh we never move forward at all we'd never do anything so so i'm pretty sure i mean i was saying to sue earlier that i get nervous about doing these presentations no matter how many times i do it, i get nervous about it so i'm stepping outside my comfort zone to do this but every time i do it it's obviously easier and i'm sure if you're doing it for the first time and remember back to the first presentation i ever did um that was like a big jump outside but you would do it in a way that was safe you would maybe do it for a small group of people you might do it in a private group where you knew everybody you would do things to make it easier when we're dealing with uh reactivity and we're working with our dogs we do at some point if we're wanting to help them to cope with things we do at some point have to expose them to things now it's the way that we do that that matters. So there are people out there who would say, yeah, we've got to expose them to things. And so they'll throw them in the deep end. It's like throwing a kid into the deep end of the swimming pool and expecting them to swim, um, you know, rather than drown. It's, it's even if they do swim, it's a really miserable thing to do because you likely to incre increase the fear rather than anything else. So what's important when we're introducing our dogs to things whether this is for a reactive dog or indeed for a puppy where you're wanting to habituate them to things that are that they're going to be seeing a lot or letting them socialize with things what we're wanting to do is make sure that that's done in a safe space in a safe environment and so one of the things that we need to do to make that safe is to um, be able to recognize when our dog is able to engage with us and when things are too much because if things are too much for our dog to engage with us then we need to do something about it we need to intervene to increase distance give them something to decompress whatever it is and so it can be really helpful to create a re-engage signal so when we're not we're not um telling our dogs what to do we're not giving them uh, commands or directions what we're doing is inviting engagements that's why this is called invitation because it's not about is the dog doing what they're told so don't think of this I, even as a cue so I know we've changed from talking about commands to talking about cues and the um, and that's fine but if there's an expectation that it will be done when you give that when you say that word that the dog will respond in a particular way and that that has to happen it's still a command um and whatever we call it so this is not that this is an invitation you are, your dog is successful whether or not they re-engage with us it's information for us it's information for us about how comfortable they are with uh, about how connected they are with us how interested they are in the environment there's a whole lot of things it might be giving us information about but if we can create that signal so that we give them a signal that says, are you ready to engage with me? 
then that gives us a way of helping them through situations where they may be getting themselves into difficulties. And the way that we can do this in ACE is through the counting game. Now, I'm pretty sure that somebody will have talked about the counting game. Is that fair to say, Sue? Has people talked about the counting game yet? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have. Somebody will have done. So again, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the counting game, but um, the counting game is Shira Patel's game. And the way that I use it, I, I would count to three um, and then I would stop. So it's like, I give them three chances to engage because sometimes the first time they don't really, they're, they're busy doing something they don't really notice. Um, and what you're doing is you're basically going one, two, three, and waiting in between those. Um, to um, see whether they can respond. And you start this when they're not focused on something and you do a count and a hand gesture because the hand gesture is like a visual signal. Um, and you're just watching your dog's response. So there's no right or wrong in this. It's simply information. So I've got a little video of this. I'm clicking on the wrong thing. I'm clicking on the wrong machine. So this is a little video um, of me doing this with my dog, Martha. This is my dog, Martha she doesn't respond and that's fine um she's not ready yet she's busy with her snuffle mat she's quite enjoying her free work it's an invitation i don't mind whether she responds or not it's just giving me information she's not ready so we will just let her continue and then she's moved around a little bit and then she was ready and then i can go somewhere else and i'll do that now normally i would do a bit more of a gesture for this and this one, I think she gets, I get to two because the first time she would just gone over there to investigate something. And again, just keep counting. You can, I mean, sure, I would count up to however many, but I would stop at three because the idea of the way that we're using it here, particularly for reactivity, is we're inviting them to engage with us. So if they don't engage after three, then you just go and move on and, and see it's not, it doesn't matter. But it's a really useful thing to have because it's one way that you can bring your dog back with you if you're in a situation where you feel perhaps your dog moves too close to something that might concern them. So at, they're in a situation where maybe there's another dog in the free work. This is way down. This is when we get onto the support section. But there's another dog in the free work and they've happened to move a bit too close. And you know that if they go any further, then they might actually be too close for them. And so what we would then do might use the counting game to invite them to move the other way with us. It's that sort of thing, okay? Um, key thing about the counting game um, in and all of these, uh, the way that we're working here um, is no attachment to outcome, NATO. Sarah calls NATO, no attachment to outcome. We are, yeah, I pick up the treats after three. So I pick up the treats. If the, if she hasn't come after three, I'll pick them up and, and take them with me. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was a question. I, I should have pulled up on the screen and or read the question or something. I always do that. Sorry. Um, but yes, I'm answering questions as are you picking up the treats after three? Um, so no attachment to outcome. We get really hung up on outcome. We get hung up on things, you know, we want this result. And it's natural because we want what we consider to be success. So when we're working with a dog who can be reactive, success often looks like our dog not reacting. And that's what we're looking for. And when we do the counting game, we have this view that success is the dog coming with us. Um, but what we want to try and get out of is the view that success is that. So success is the dog doing whatever the dog needs to do in that moment. And that might be engaging with us, or it might be decompressing with the snuffle mat that they're already engaged with. And that is fine. It's information. It's telling us that they're deeply engaged with something else in their environment, or that they're too worried to come and, and, and engage with us, or they may be you know, they're, they're, they don't know the game well enough yet, or there's all sorts of things that it might be telling us. But we, we're getting um, we're getting information. So just a key thing is is no attachment to outcome. And this is a, it's a good principle to live by. You know, if you're if you're interested in choice based learning, 
choice-based training, then no attachment outcome becomes very, very important. Then we move on to the third element, which is the, the introductions. And free work is a great context to do habituation to things that you, your dog has never seen. So getting them used to things that they, they don't, they, they haven't uh, seen before. So great for puppies and things like that. And also for counter conditioning. So if there's something your dog is concerned about, then it can be really helpful to change how they feel about things. Because what you can do is introduce it very slowly and gradually within the context of something which is familiar because your dog knows the free work and also which is enjoyable for the dog. So it's kind of bringing that counter conditioning in naturally. And we can introduce all sorts of things in uh, free work. So we can introduce items. Um, items like the umbrella so the I, the reason i would introduce an umbrella is because i use um a thing called the umbrella game which is where you teach your dog to hide behind an umbrella so you know those situations when you're out in the park and um a stray dog's coming running towards you you can carry a portable pop-up umbrella you can put it this is something tracy mcclennan taught me you can uh, open it in front of your dog and as long as your dog is comfortable and sees that as a game that they hide behind the umbrella it will stop the other dog because the other dog will suddenly not be able to see your dog and will have this thing not popped up in their face because that's a bit mean but popped up so that it's in front of them so you might want to habituate your dog to an umbrella because it may be that it's not something they're familiar with a harness. So it may be either habituation or counter conditioning to a harness. If your dog is unhappy with a the harness, then you may want to introduce a new harness within free work. Muzzles, all those sorts of things can be introduced within free work. We can also introduce the lesser version of whatever our dog's triggers are. So if our dog's trigger is other dogs, then it could be dog bedding. It could be a toy that another dog has played with. It could be a stuffy so that you get in the shape of, the do of another dog without the reality of a dog. Uh, if it's humans that your dog is reactive to, then it could be human clothing that you're using. Um, you, you could also use, I guess, sort of uh, dressmakers, dummies and things like that. I haven't done that, but I'm sure you could use all sorts of things like that. So you're creating something which is a lesser version. It could be sound. So if your dog's sound sensitive, we can introduce low volume sound at a distance into a free work environment. So there's all sorts of things we can do. And the thing with introductions is what we're doing is doing this within the context of free work. So first of all, they have to be familiar with free work. So the first thing is you get them so that free work is a safe place. Free work is somewhere, something that they enjoy doing, that they're familiar with, that they've done a few times. You wouldn't do this in their first experience of free work. Make sure it's, they're comfortable. You've already identified things that they uh, enjoy and you're making sure that those things are included in your free work. And then you would just add this in and you might add in a dog bed or you might add in the muscle into the free work you are not directing the dog that they have to go and investigate it it's not a, oh come over here and see this it's a it's just part of the furniture and you can investigate it if you want to and so i'm just going to show you um yeah so you, you're never um forcing them you're not luring them you're not even kind of encouraging them to go and investigate things. That's our human tendency because we want to see what they'll do. But remember your job when your dog is doing free work is to observe your dog. So you, you put the thing in there and then you observe what happens. And some dogs, dog reactive dogs, if you put another dog's coat or another dog's bedding in their thing, if the, that dog is right, will will avoid. You will actually see them sort of sniff at it and move away. Some dogs will go up and investigate it just the way they would investigate anything else that was in the environment. And some dogs will kind of almost startle away from it. They'll sniff it and they'll kind of be a little bit, oh, what's going on? Dogs will respond differently to the scent of another dog within free work. And it's up to them to, there's no, again, no attachment outcome. It's it's not about whether they're investigating it and whether they're exploring it. It's just whether or not they are comfortable with it there in the environment. Um, you always want to have food available elsewhere. So it's not that you just put the food on that so that they have to go and get the, you know, you want to make sure that there's food everywhere, just as you would it normally. And 
ideally you work in keep working free so so and this is a thing which is really nice about being able to work with um reactivity a lot of the time when you're working with reactivity you have to have for safety you have to have equipment on a dock so you have to have a harness and a lead or whatever and when you work when we start introducing people or other dogs into the environment we will have to do that but at this point because we're talking about using things that are inanimate you can just have your dog working free still um, and you can get an idea to see how your dog is responding to things and of course remove things if they cause concern decrease intensity so move them further out of the environment so that they're not not um, that your dog's not having to walk past them or whatever but uh, yeah so just to give you a little bit of a this is just a little composite of video of things. So here we've got this Dakota and she's just investigating that dog bed. And it's actually a dog bed belonging to a dog she lives with, but she's kind of going, oh yeah, that's Jess's bed. I don't want anything to do with that. Um, she's not particularly reactive toward the dogs, but she's just investigating that. And then she goes to her snuffle mat. And then here we've got a little dog who's getting used to an umbrella and the umbrella is just sitting there. Here it's moving a little bit. Yeah, so there's a little bit more intensity there moving it's picked up and so on so this is sophie ros is sophie um then we we might if we've got a dog who's a reactive to people we might use a coat something like that so there's things that we can do to just have that there's a muzzle just sitting on the station and dakota's not bothered about that at all because she's muzzle um muzzle trained so she's used to to wearing a muzzle when she needs to um but yeah you can just put it there or put it somewhere as part of the furniture so your dog gets a gentle introduction to it within the context of pre-work so that's your your third thing oh i'm using the wrong mouse again we'll never get No, there we go. All right. So before we move on to this, have we got any other? Okay. So generally comments, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the fourth thing, and this is where we start working with a real dog or a real human, um, and where we're doing perhaps setups. So how might you do a setup with um, within an ACE context, and the first thing is like with any um, setups that we do, we have to think about safety. So we have to think about what what can we do to make sure that both our dog, the dog who we are working with and the helper dog are safe and the human for that matter, if, if you've got a dog who's reactive to humans. So how can you make sure that they're safe and how can you make sure that the distance is still appropriate? So using this, doing this within ACE is not an excuse to reduce distance, to, to, to um, yeah, to reduce the distance, to, to bring a dog in and make them work closer than they would be comfortable with another dog or a human. Um, what we're wanting to do is create a context where we've got ACE happening for, for the dog uh, because that becomes a support mechanism for the dog. Um, but we're still keeping distance. We're still making sure that things are safe and we can create safety with barriers. So we can have a barrier so that um, the, the dog can't reach another dog or a human. Or we can have use sliding long line. And a sliding line, again, I'm not sure if you've, you've a thing, I would imagine that somebody will have talked about sliding lines at some point during the, the month. Um, but um, a sliding line is basically a soft cotton, cotton rope. We use um, circus rope, it's, it's, it's really soft uh, rope. And um, you pass it just through the ring on the harness. So it's literally just, I'll show you a video of it in action but it's literally just a rope tied together at the end because otherwise your dog might slide off it. Um, and so that you can just let the rope slide through. So you've got your dog connected to you, but your dog is still able to freely move. Um, it's about as free as they can, but obviously they will have equipment on, they will have a harness on, um, usually a harness. You, you could potentially do it with a collar, but I would be much more wary about doing it with a collar. Um, you want to make sure that the, it's a nice, light, comfortable 
line for everybody and just be aware of yourself when you're carrying it because it's really easy to let rope float around if you've got a long line you could hold it and you've got loads of rope hanging down and swinging about and that can whack dogs in the face or just be frightening so just be very aware of yourself and keep things neatly with you uh, and that goes with leads as well just be careful about that and then we'll, we'll use stroking the lead which is a technique another technique sarah's um to just encourage our dog to move away if they need to so again if your dog is moving in the direction that is not safe for them we'll move them away gradually gently we'll move them gently away using the line stroking and i'm just going to show you uh those a little bit just so that you you in case we you haven't seen these so this is sophie again on a sliding line you can see you put the line through this is the kind of rope we use tie the ends and then you've got the rope and you can actually open your hands like that i'm doing here you can open your hands so that you can move so use both your hands and let the rope flow smoothly through um and and it just allows your dog to move with the a connection for safety but with as little influence as possible i think that's the key thing and then for those of you who may not know stroking the lead this is henry you've probably seen this video before this is one of sarah's videos um and um henry spotting the horses and this is just where he where sarah gently strokes the line and you'll see in a moment she'll start just stroking the line and he'll he's quite intensely focused on those horses but she's able to just here she goes you can see that just hand movement there just stroking the line a little bit and in a second, he's going to respond. He responds first by eating something. Interesting that Henry had uh, stomach issues, I think, at this point. And then he comes back. And there's no pulling. There's no um, forcing. It's just an invitation. OK. I think there is more on this video. I don't know. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so you can do this with a lead as well, of course. So this is a dog on a workshop of mine and um, he spotted something up the field and she just strokes the lead and then reinforces coming back. So again, she's stroking the lead. So you've got that invitation. Come this way again here, just stroking the lead and then moves away. So just to allow the dog to move away and this is a great video, Melaine's video um, of uh, a dog. And here you see a dog reacting to, I think it was some cattle. Um, and it's a lovely video. The dog starts reacting. And when, she start, when she's pulling and keeping that line tight, the dog carries on. She starts to stroke the lead. Immediately the dog moves away. It takes the tension out of the lead. If you're pulling a dog who's reacting, they're just going to react more. So stroking the lead can take that away. And so what we can do when we're in this situation with our dogs, if we're doing work with a, in a setup or when we're out on walks even, um, we can use this approach to just bring them back away from something that they're going to get themselves into trouble with or that's going to make them uh, feel more insecure or whatever. So, um, oh. Oh, subtitles. I didn't mean to hit subtitles. I don't want subtitles. There we go. Okay, so the way I do, I'd set up a, a setup in um, in Ace, I would give the other dog um, free work to do. Does the, okay, a uh, question here. Does the material of the lead and or the attachment to the harness matter? Not really. I have actually stroked pretty much every kind of lead. Uh, the only one that I can think that it um, it probably wouldn't work terribly well on is a chain lead. You know, those big chunky chain leads because you can't feel anything. Uh, but it might still work. I don't know. I've never I've never done that. But I have stroked sliding, I have obviously the cotton lines and, and the normal sort of webbing leads and leather leads and things like that. But also things like um, uh, slip leads and... Um, dogs like in a shelter you know where a dog is wearing a slip lead to move from one kennel i've used i've stroked those i've used uh, a a flexi on a flexi lead 
just lock the flexi and and stroke the the, the lead so yeah you can stroke pretty much anything um and it is amazing it is amazing the key thing about stroking the lead is to make sure that you are watching your own body a lot of the time when we're doing anything with our dogs it's how we are that is influencing things so if we are tense when we're stroking the lead we're doing this and that's not going to be helpful whereas if we're actually moving our whole body as we stroke so we're moving through the whole body and we're moving our feet and we're looking where we want to go. So we're actually kind of like, let's go this way. So it's not that you're avoiding looking at your dog, um, but you're actually moving and, and moving your whole orientation of your body in the direction you want to go. Then that is going to be much more effective than standing, staring at the dog and stroking the lead. Yeah. So those things are really important. Okay. I'm aware that we're at eight o'clock and I said I'd be an hour, but I'm going to be a bit longer than that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so a key thing that I would do with, uh, with a setup is I would give the other dog free work to do. And I think that this is a really important benefit that ACE has. So a lot of the time when we have dogs working as helper dogs, uh, that is the dog, the stooge dog, people sometimes call them the helper dog, the dog that the other dog is looking at. It's stressful for that dog. You know, if you're a dog who, even if you're really social and really um, not bothered about other dogs at all, if another dog is being intense towards you, that can be stressful. So what we want to do is give the other dog something to focus on. So the other dog is also doing free work. So you could have two free work areas set up, perhaps with a barrier between, perhaps not. But the dogs are on sliding lines, so they're not going to get to each other, but they get the opportunity to move around. And it's, it's kind of like a choreograph um, role that you take um okay so yeah watch the rest on catch up please sir i'm sorry that you have to leave um okay so allow your dog to choose where they're going so a really important principle that it's your dog's choice your dog can choose and one of the things i love about this is that the natural movement around the free work means that your dog is going towards the other dog and moving away in a very natural way. Yeah, so it's not that you're here and then, you know, your dog's okay with it, so you move a bit closer and then your dog's okay with it and then you move a bit closer and then they're not okay. It's not like that. It's very natural and organic. So your dog moves a little bit towards, but then moves away and then moves a little bit towards and then moves away. And it's, it's very much more organic. And it's directed by the dog. So your dog chooses and is allowed to choose where they go and what direction they go in unless they're getting too close. So if you know because you've observed your dog that your dog is going to be have a problem if they get 10 foot within 10 foot of another dog, then if they're getting to 15 foot, then you would start to move them away or even 20 foot, you would start to move them so that they, you would use stroking the lead, you would use the counting game. And that's why you get those invitations in first so that you've got the tools to be able to support your dog to, uh, to make choices which are gonna be successful. And you're allowing that natural movement and that engagement at the dog's pace. So you're not, if the dog doesn't wanna go towards the other dog, they don't have to. If your dog wants to stay at this end of the free work, and have the, the other dog at the other end and in their space, then that's absolutely fine. It's all no attachment to outcome. We're not trying to get our dog closer to another dog. We're just allowing them to explore free work in a context where another dog is also exploring free work. And like I say, we use the uh, count and game and line stroking if we need to. I hope this is all making sense. I'm going to show you again a couple of videos. So this is uh, an example of we've moved on. Um, hang on, let me just take that take that question off for a second. Would you just take the question off for a second and then we'll come back to it. Um, okay, let me just go back with this. So we've moved on now to the coat that was there is now on a human. So we've got a real person, but notice the human is they're, they're just out they're on the edge they're not engaging it's not anybody trying to talk to the dog and this is not a, a set a real setup this is a setup for filming so um we've not got any because this is a lot closer than it would be normally but so she's working through the free work 
And if she moves, uh, she's on a line, she's on a long line. This is just a long line, literally a long line threaded through the harness. As she goes towards them, then I'm thinking, oh, she's getting a bit close. So I just invite her away. Here's a setup with two dogs that each have their own area of the free work and they can explore. And here he's coming a little bit closer to the other dog. She's just focusing on her snuffle mat. Um, and you just see them just doing their own thing. Um, and then we've got an example in, um, oh, all right, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll answer this question. So the, yeah, so when working with a helper dog, do you have them start their free work first? So they're out when the reactive dog gets out or do you get the reactive dog to start first, then bring the other dog? It depends probably is the answer to that. Probably I would have them working in the free work and bring the reactive dog out because it's often easier for a dog to feel that they're following them, that another dog comes in and changes the environment. So they're coming into an environment where that dog is in the environment. But there might be situations where I would bring in a dog into the um, to do free work somewhere else. If it was, for instance, a dog who had got to the point where they were actually really comfortable with other dogs working near them, but they were still struggling perhaps with sudden appearances, then you might start to do some sudden appearances in a, in a controlled way, in a way that was um, where the dog had the safe, the support and the safety of the free work and enough distance, you might start to do that. So there are some situations where you, where you would do that. But normally, yes, I would um, I would probably bring the um, have the the helper dog out first and then the reactive dog. <coughs> OK. So when you're doing these setups, it's ideal you would have a third person so that if you're a trainer or a behaviorist, that would be you. Um, and you'd have somebody handling the helper dog and somebody handling the um, dog who can react. And you want to be able to communicate with both people. It's ideally also the the two people handling the dogs can also communicate. But the, the good thing about having a third person is that they get to see the whole picture. Because if you're working with your dog, you're very focused on what's going on with your dog, and rightly so. What you want is somebody else who can look at the whole picture and choreograph. So if you think about this as a dance, the dog's dancing, they're moving to and from and to and from. You want somebody who's um, able to see the big picture, to spot the signs that a dog is getting a little bit stressed by something and to do something to intervene, to move them away or to do something different. Um, and you want it to look boring. So I've got an example here, which is, um, it was taken at Tilly Farm. It's uh, Roz, um, Roz's video. And um, this is Sophie, Roz and Sophie. Now, spot who is the reactive dog here, really. It's the thing that one of these dogs is reactive, reactive, um, and one isn't. Um, that's the way it would be described. I think it's uh, it's very hard to 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 see really to tell. But what you've got here is you can see that Roz is communicating there. Roz is in the red. She's communicating where she's going to make sure that they don't go head into each other. She's doing a little bit of counting game with Sophie, who's familiar with the counting game, who's familiar with Ace. Uh, you've got the other dog there who is um, also familiar with Ace and working through. And you can see that these two are working in the same space. So they are actually working at a distance, but within a big space where they can both go into each other's part of it. Sophie has a drink. Water is very important when you're doing things that involve um, thought and processing so you have to have water within your free work and then notice how much choice she has you know Ros is just mooching along with her uh, they're both just mooching along with the dogs but when she starts to move that way so she starts to move over towards the other dog Ros just brings her a little bit that way with her with her um a, a bit of a I think it, it was just a counting game she's using so they're avoiding that sort of head-on collision sort of thing we don't want the dogs we're not pushing the dogs to get closer and closer and closer we just want them to be comfortable in the same space yeah so uh, these dogs uh, the um Sophie is the one who 
is supposedly um, reactive. I mean, she she has had react uh, reactivity has been a, a, a something she's uh, Ross has worked a lot with, um, and she can find it difficult with other dogs. But in that context, she was absolutely comfortable with the other dog being there because everything was uh, kept in a way in a way that she could handle. And that gives her a really good experience of being in a space with another dog, which is what we want. Okay, so how can you calm a dog down if they see a cat which appears from nowhere? <clears throat> Sometimes things happen you can't anticipate. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what, we'll talk about that a little bit in the next section. So the last section, we'll say a little bit about that. So if we can hold that question until then, that would be great. Um, so... The other thing about the support part of this and setups is that free work, I think, makes a really great context for other conversational training techniques, such as look at that, Leslie McDevitt's LAT, look at that, or LATTE, is, which is her latest thing with it, which is look at that, then enrichment. And in that, free work becomes the T bit, the LATTE bit, the T bit um, in LATTE. So what you've got with free work is uh, being able to facilitate a natural decompression and exploration because it's there within that context already. And they've also got the choice about whether they continue to engage with you or they just go on and carry on with their free work. So you don't, that conversation, you've got that extra level of choice within the conversation. Um, and you can have your dog tell you. So the, the great thing about that is that it's it's a conversation with your dog. So you basically, uh, uh, your dog learns that they can tell you that there's something in the environment. They're kind of like, instead of seeing the, the other dog say and going, oh my God, there's another dog. They see the other dog and go, there's another dog over there. And they tell you about it. And you can, you can then see from the way that they're telling you about it, how comfortable or not they are with that. So it becomes very much a conversation. And the great thing about doing this within free work is that they've also got the choice of being able to go off and do other things if they feel that they need to decompress. And they um, can use, they, when they tell you about the trigger, they can use that to, to ask you to reload the free work, so to, to put more, more food down. So you can start to actually build it into the way that you do free work as well. And it's it's a, it makes it really lovely. And I've got a little video here from um, she's Sonia, Sonia Catherall, who's, um, she's currently training in ACE, but she's also um, a, a Control Unleashed instructor, certified instructor with Leslie McDevitt. And here you've got Harry. Now you'll notice over here, you might not, not notice, but I don't point it out, that there's a, a stuffy dog so Harry is your reactive dog, and he can be reactive to, uh, to, to other dogs. Um, there's a stuffy dog and a handler for that stuffy dog. And uh, we've got a little bit of free work laid out here. And if you just watch what happens here, Harry is familiar with free work, and he's familiar with the look at that game. So when he sees something in the environment, he can tell Sonia about it, and he will be reinforced for that. He, he knows he will get something good as a result of that. Um, so let me just play this for you and let's see the different things that you can do. So at the moment, he's just doing free work. So he's just doing in his snuffle mat, he's exploring. And then Sonia starts with a bit of the counting game to get some engagement with her. And then he goes back to his, his licky mat. And he's just exploring. So the other dog is not a concern for him at the moment. But then he's noticed it there. Did you see he just noticed it, but went back himself to just do his free work. So not so no, no need to actually do anything. And Sonia started to be ready to intervene then and didn't. Um, and then a bit counting game again. And now you'll start to see him, I think, do. Oh, no, he's not. Yep bit more counting game and then you'll start to see him do there did you see that little I think it got a bit jolty but he did a little bit of a look over towards the other dog and she reinforced that onto the ground it's a bit of a jolty video I will I know what's coming up now
yeah, there you see the look at that. And she does it to, to uh, directly to him. So that was just a look at that. That was a, a, a standard look at that. And then he could go back into his free work. But then he looks over and she then, it's a, let's reload the free work. So he's able to control that by telling her what's in the environment. And it just takes all of the anxiety out of that and it becomes a fun conversation that you're having with your person as opposed to there's something scary over there so it's a really really helpful um thing to do and and what i really love about this is that all of these techniques are things that you can you know you don't have to choose you don't have to say oh we're only doing ace or we're only doing um you know you can reload it in different ways with the, there's reloading it with the supple mat but you don't have to choose between you know, control unleashed or bat or ace or whatever, because I mean, a lot of what we're doing in that, that um, those of you who know anything about bat behavior adjustment training, will also have recognized some of that in what we were doing in the free work, the moving to and fro and the, that sort of dance. It's just happening within a free work context. And here we're doing, we're using look at that and we're using latte, but within the context of free work. And it's just bringing these things together is gives real power to all of them and i think it's a really lovely way to um to work um so the last thing is what do we do when we're out and about so i'm conscious of the time and i'm going to go to 90 minutes as i did last time and i apologize um but the the last part of this is to take things out with you to scaffold your dog which is you know again supporting giving giving a way of helping them to cope with things, to take the key elements with you when you go out on walks. So somebody asked, what do you do to calm a dog down? Well, there are certain things you could do immediately. The first thing is you get them out of the situation. So if, there's a, if they're getting excited about something, squirrels, cats, whatever, move them further away to a point where they're not going to be excited by them, uh, if you can. So if they're, if they're on a, a line, stroke the light lead, move away, give them more distance. But then you want decompression. So one thing that you can do is you can carry portable versions of the things you've noticed your dog immediately goes to within the free work. And again, this is where ACE can help you because it can help you to see what your dog's natural choice is to decompress. If your dog will always go first to the snuffle mat, then snuffling and searching is probably a good decompressor for them. If your dog always goes to the licky mat when something's happened in the environment, then the chances are they want to lick when they need to decompress. And you can create, you can take things with you. So here we've got a grooming mitt, which makes a really good licky mat. You can just load it up and have it in your pocket. Um, a, a flat microfiber mitt makes a really nice little portable snuffle mat for the times when you haven't got grass. So sometimes, of course, use natural things as well. If you've got grass, put it in the grass. Absolutely fine. But if you're, if you're walking down the street and you don't have grass, just pull out your portable snuffle mat and they can still snuffle within that. So it can make it really helpful to take these things out. You can also get little portable snuffle mats, really, literally, that you know, little drawstring bag and things you can take with you. So take these things out with you on walks so that you've got something to help them decompress with. Because that will really help um, as they... Um, you know the, the things that you encounter because as you say as somebody said in their question you can't and it was let me bring that question up again uh sometimes ha things happen that you can't anticipate so first thing get them more distant so that they are able to cope and second thing give them something to decompress and a portable version of the thing that they really uh choose and prefer uh, prefer from the free work is a great example of that Okay. And then you can also use portable or environmental stations. So one of the things that we would do within free work is we'd have the stations and we would use the counting game to move from one station to the next. And the station becomes a visual. The station is a visual thing that the dog can actually move towards. So you can use these. And if you haven't got things in the environment, like this picture, you've got benches that you could use as stations. You've got trees that you could use as stations. You've got lampposts. You've got a wall at the back there. You could use any of those things as stations. But if you haven't got those, you can get these little bowls, which are great. 
um, for just um, putting, you know, turning upside down and making little stations or even just using as bowls to for things like the Super Bowls game from if you know that from Liz and whatever, just to follow uh, a, a, a lot of uh, to, to, to have visual clues to, to follow. Uh, Please be aware American lawns are often toxic from chemicals. Okay, so you wouldn't use those for um, snuffling in. So therefore having something portable that you can carry with you is even more important in that context if you're not sure that you uh, can do that. Okay, so we're nearly done. We are pretty much done actually. So it's just to summarize, you know, the things we can use ACE, the ways that ACE can help us, helps us with observation. We want to be seeing all of those nervous system responses, physical, postural, behavioral responses, and recognizing what the candles are that are lighting for our dogs so that we can snuff them out, as many of them as possible. We want to be inviting our dogs to offer engagement with us with no attachment to outcome. So we're not worrying about whether or not they're doing it or not. We're just inviting them and using that as information to, to let us know whether they're comfortable or not. And Third thing, introductions, habituation, counting, additioning with less versions of the triggers or with things that you're wanting to get your dog used to, like a harness or a, a muzzle or something like that. Support. We can do setups within free work and it's really helpful and we can do them with other techniques such as lat and latte. And that brings additional power to both. And then finally, we can scaffold our walks by taking portable elements from the free work that we've done, take them with us on the road, because then we can use those when we need to help our dogs to calm down. OK, so any other questions that anybody has, I am happy to answer. I know we're well over time and I apologize. I'm always well over time. Sue, come on in. Let's get this off. There we go. Well, that's been amazing. That has some really nice comments as well. Uh, one of the early one of the early questions was, um, how can we deal with the re the reactions of other people? Oh gosh, okay, that's a whole talk in <laughs> I itself. I know that's a loaded really question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a um, that's a whole thing in itself. My first thing is reframing for that. So we often. OK, so we we make assumptions when somebody reacts to us, we make an assumption. So if somebody looks at us askance when our dog barks, we'll make an assumption based on our feelings about it. So it's often what's going on for us is that we're embarrassed or we're concerned. We often will then make an assumption that they're judging. We'll make yeah. an assumption that they're judging or that they are angry with us or whatever sometimes that is just not true sometimes it's just that they're that our dogs barked and they're looking over to see because they heard a dog bark and so the first thing is if you have no grounds to assume otherwise i.e they haven't spoken to you just reframe it and think well what are the other reasons they might be looking so somebody stares at you starts looking at you because your dog's reacting what are they thinking they might be thinking well that's terrible which is what we always assume they're thinking, isn't it? Yeah. But they might also be thinking, oh, I've got a reactive dog. I really feel for that person and they're handling it really well. Or they might be thinking, or oh, wonder what that is. Or they might just be thinking, oh my goodness, it's a beagle. I love beagles. Yeah. yeah? There's lots of other things. And the point is we can't tell. We don't know what they're actually thinking. So we can just assume that, and as soon as we start reframing like that, and I call it three accounts game, just think of three where, three possible explanations for anything. And you will find that just doing that, it doesn't matter what the truth is, but just doing that will help you. Yeah, and, and you basically know, get, get your dog yeah. out as well. <laughs> Oh, yeah, get your dog out of the situation. Obviously, you're focusing on your dog first. That's the most important thing is so your dog is moved out of that. But the other thing about it is even if somebody gives you a hard time and says, oh, that dog, you shouldn't have that dog there. The chances are, again, reframe that. You know, what is behind that for them? Because it isn't that most people are not in the business of yelling at strangers. So either they're scared yeah. or they are worried for their dog or they've had a bad day at work and they're just taking it out on you there's a hole that you can still reframe it 
you can still reframe it. So the, it, I find reframing is a really useful way to actually shift our own thinking because we tend to be the ones that are putting the pressure on ourselves. And if we can just reframe that so that we don't have to worry about it, then it can start to, to get us to that place where we no longer care about it. And that's where we want it to get to. Um, I must admit, I've, I've read that in your book and I do use that a lot. Yeah. You know, when I'm feeling, oh, God, they're looking at me. And, yeah. You know, or even if somebody's shouting at me, you know, I think, well, you know, I've, they've probably had a bad day at work. They've probably had a bad day. Their the life's feel... probably worse than mine. <laughs> <laughs> but they're yelling at a stranger in the park, you know. And and, and, and I think that that's, it, it is down to us to look at what is coming up for us. So yeah. we feel things because we're feeling guilty, because we're feeling that the, that our dog is not meeting our expectations of how we're feeling like we're not a good dog, dog, guardian, yeah. whatever. And yeah, I think it we, we, we just get to use some of these little tools to deal with this. Uh, can we use this for puppies that are fearful and reactive? Absolutely, 100%. All of this you could do with puppies. Absolutely. You could do this with puppies. Um, with if you've got a puppy who's fearful and that it's sort of normal puppy fear, you know that they're going through a fear, fear phase and they're a little bit worried about things, then just give them a really safe environment. So let them explore safely, but don't have anything coming into that environment that's going to be really stressy for them. Because what you don't want is to give them a bad experience in that environment. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can you can do this if you've got. Um, if you've got puppies who are, are struggling with their environment totally the free work is great for it and just bringing things one at a time into that environment um, so that they get to explore things at their own pace it's really good I always use free work for the first introduction to my salon that's all they do just free yeah. work yeah and it just Absolutely. seems to work so well yeah and I think that's great. It's the sort of habituation to you want them to get used to something, but you want them to get used to it as a positive thing. Yeah. And so when they've never had an experience of something, what better way to give them an experience than to give them it within a context of something that they love doing, like free work. It's great, you know, that they really enjoy. I've got another question. Okay, taking care of two different dogs in my home and done free work with them. They both prefer sniffing by far. However, they'll lick people. Oh, why to get them to stop licking people? Okay, <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, um, I think sometimes licking people, it depends on the context really, but it could be an appeasing thing. So it could be that they're slightly worried by the, those people. Um, it possibly I, I it's without seeing the behavior and seeing the dogs and knowing the context there's all sorts of possibilities with this um but um you know what i mean what what if you if it's a problem if it's a problem for you that they're i mean if they're going up and randomly licking strangers in the street i can see it could possibly be a problem then giving them something else perhaps that will read that that they can if they've got that need to to lick in that situation then you probably need a bit of distance from those people and give them something else that they could that they can focus on. So you could do your your portable uh, licky mat would be a good one for that. Yeah. My but, poodle, one of my poodles, she if people visit us, uh, particularly my mother, she will just sit on my mum's knee and just lick throughout. But I think that's I think she's so excited she has to do she has yeah. to do it. Sometimes it's excitement that they just yeah. want to. They sometimes it's it's a little bit of appeasement. You know, I'm not I'm no yeah. I'm no um, threat. Sometimes it's been reinforced. Sometimes it's you know they they basically you know people lick them and and they go oh they're kissing me and they make it all and and they get they get um, reinforcement for that. It's they yeah. get a positive outcome for that, and so they'll do it again. Um, and without knowing the details, it's hard to sort of advise on that sort of thing. But um, but yeah, I mean, if you want them to lick something that is acceptable in public, then <laughs> take it with you. <laughs> And load it up with cream cheese or something. <laughs> okay. Do we have any more questions or are we just about all done? I think it's just general Thank comments. Of, okay. Thank you and brilliant. Oh, and lovely. Awesome. Well, I will come back to the questions um, and make sure that I've covered everything. But uh, thank you all for coming on a Saturday yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Janet. That was just so, so informative. Lots of little... Because I think that's it. People don't want to have to put a lot of effort into it. 
and free work's just so easy to do it and it, yeah it's an easy totally. option so. and it makes it it gives you a really because it's the same framework for so many things it gives you something which is very very um from, becomes very familiar and is very positive so it's a positive experience that is familiar to them and then you can do all sorts of things within that context so yeah. you see it as a context so I mean I would use free work as a context for training so if you were training something and you wanted to give your dog choice to be engaging with the training or not then I would actually be doing it within free work context because then yeah. they can disappear off and do their whatever they want to do if in the free work or they can come and engage with you. So it's, it's I think, a really, really powerful approach. And yeah. um, I, I see it as context for a lot of things that I would want to be doing with dogs. Yeah, well, I think, cool. I think that's... I think well, we're done you. with questions. Oh, I think we're done with the questions. Yeah, so I think we're, we're done with questions now. Yeah. I have the current one. There we go. I think we've... Yep. Yeah. And thank you, Sue, for um, you giving up your Saturday night as well. <laughs> <laughs> well I'd, to be quite honest i'd have watched it anyway so it makes no difference whether i'm oh, watching it or keeping my own one more question how would you do that in training as you're asking the dog to do a task okay so you're asking the key is in the word you've just used asking no attachment to outcome so if we're doing choice-based training what we're wanting to do is say you know you have a choice and it's a real choice you have a choice to engage with me and I have food or I have my, a toy or you have a choice to do something else. And if you want to do something else, that's absolutely fine. And that's just as much success as coming and doing the thing with me. And that's the change of mindset that we need to have. It's not saying work with me and that success go over there and somehow I failed. It's work with me and have success, work over there or do your own thing over there and have success. That's what choice really is. And, and the thing with the training is what you will find is your dog will engage with you when they're ready to engage with you. And when they're not, they'll go and decompress elsewhere. And that is absolutely fine. You don't, um, you know, it doesn't matter. And it's when you get it out of the idea that they have to do what you've told them to do. Um, and you accept that sometimes for whatever reason, maybe they're tired, maybe they've just need some time to process maybe they've had enough and they don't want to do any more all of those options are perfectly fine, fine valid choices and when we get that idea rather than the old school way of thinking that when you tell a dog to do something they have to do it and you have to make sure they do it and the barbara woodhouse thing of you have to make sure they do it and i know we don't do that anymore but but you know we still have that old thing of once you've given a cue you've got to see it through you know and why it's a, yeah, it's I, a request it's a request we're asking our dogs to do something so yeah yeah and, and i think and also, if, no, that's totally valid. If, if they come back to do the training they're going to be able to concentrate more on it yeah. because they're not thinking about what's over there and they'll probably learn a lot quicker yeah doing it that way as well absolutely and their and their mind is on it because they've chosen to be engaged yeah. with it and i think that that's the important thing and and you might think that they would never come and choose that but it's not the case because they enjoy doing the training so they will come and choose it um but they might not always choose it and i think that's the key thing so we can i just say we're going to be actually doing a master class on this um in heart dog um over in heart dog we're going to be doing a master class on oh um choice based training um and the whole we'll be talking about this a lot more and how ace fits in with that and all the rest of it and you can um register for that it's going to be in zoom and you can register for it so uh i will drop the the link i haven't got the link handy but i will drop the link in the um in the in the chat here so that you if you want to register for that you can but it's a free master class you can come along and uh, and see that and we'll talk a lot more about that okay all right i think we're going to have to finish because we're way we're way over time now but um it, it might also be worth dropping the link to your book in as well because i found okay yeah okay. valuable so uh, I, I, will, I, will well. do that. I will do that okay all right thank you so much for your attention i'm amazed that you're still here everybody and uh, uh if you're watching this on replay then just 
put uh, put comments, just put replay, and then um, be able to spot the things that have not been answered, and come back and answer them in the chat. Well, thanks very much, Janet. That is uh, well, very welcome. Thank you, Sue, so, and thank you for all of the whole month. I've still got loads to catch up with. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> all right then. Take care, everybody. See, See you. Bye. Bye. bye.